It's a privilege to be gathered together for Bible study this morning. We are completing our review of Deuteronomy chapter 14, and we will go into chapter 15 this morning, which brings us face to face with some very new material having to do with what we might call the socioeconomics of the kingdom. And we're going to be looking at the question of poverty. But before we get there, we need to draw a conclusion to our chapter review last week of Deuteronomy chapter 14, where we were looking at the dietary rules that God gave the children of Israel as they were getting ready to enter the promised land. Now, let's remind ourselves that all of this system, which later became known as kosher, this system was intended to differentiate the children of Israel from the pagan peoples they would displace in Canaan, in the Promised Land. The principle is this. As the children of Israel were going into the land of promise, they were inheriting a land, taking a land that God had given them, but it was a land that had been inhabited by pagan people. It had been the arena of pagan practices. It had been the site of pagan worship. And as the Lord is calling together His people as he has now taken them through the exodus and through the, wander, the, the wanderings in the wilderness, and now he is bringing them into the land of his promise, he is saying, you cannot live like these people, you cannot look like these people, you cannot sound like these people, you cannot worship as those people, you can't even eat like they eat. Now, we do not know God's inner logic of the entire kosher system. There, there are some things we can infer from the kosher plan, as set out here in Deuteronomy chapter 14. It's repeated back from Leviticus. This isn't the first time they've heard it, but it's presented here in Deuteronomy 14 with greater explanation. One of the things has to do with health. There are some important health regulations here. The avoidance of pork is an important thing in a culture where cooking could not be so satisfactorily measured and monitored as is the case for us. Avoiding trichinosis, avoiding different kinds of diseases. You know, one of the things that, uh, the, the chewing of the cud was very important because that removed certain, well, impurities, let's just say, that otherwise would be in the meat. And so there are some logical things we can understand from this, but there are others that really we do not know, uh, you know, why they weren't to eat certain kinds of animals that uh, we don't think of as being particularly unclean. We must assume that the logic was that God said, we, we want to make a clean break. I'm going to order you to make a clean break with the dietary habits of the peoples you will displace because their dietary habits were rooted in a pagan system and in a pagan understanding, and you're going to live in a different way. But the question comes to us now, why is it that we do not live kosher? At least most of us do not. If you had bacon with your eggs this morning, then... Uh, not only were you enjoying one of those wonderful cholesterol fixes, but you were breaking kosher. You're not supposed to be eating those things. Uh, you know, we, we do not follow kosher dietary law. Why? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 10. Another familiar passage, but it is the bookend, we might consider, to Deuteronomy chapter 14 in the life of the church. And here you have, of course, the setup for Peter, Simon, who is now Peter, to go and visit Cornelius, the Gentile centurion. But before he goes to visit with, with Cornelius and uh, before he shares with Cornelius' family, you'll notice that Peter is, look at verse 9. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Now, where is Peter at this moment? Peter is in the ho on the housetop of a tanner named Simon. Now, here you have a problem already. We, we looked at this when we were going through the book of Acts. A tanner is a man who makes leather goods. That means he has to handle dead animal bodies. That kind of goes with it. That means he has to scrape skins. A tanner is unclean. And everything a tanner touches is unclean. And Peter, who's been hyper-scrupulous about keeping kosher all his life, is now living in the house of a tanner. It's, it's almost like, a, you know, a, a comedy set up here. Because you can imagine how Peter is so uncomfortable in this tanner's house. So he goes up on the rooftop. Up on the rooftop, he can perhaps get away for a little bit from the tanner's business. 
but he can't get away from God's point. Notice that he was on the sixth hour to pray, but he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. So here in Acts chapter 10, Peter, waiting for dinner, literally, falls into a dream. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it, that is in the sheet, all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Now let's just stop there for a moment. Here is Peter in this trance or dream, hearing the command from the Lord that he should go to this sheet filled with all kinds of animals, mixed clean and unclean, and kill indiscriminately and eat indiscriminately. And Peter says, oh, oh, no, Lord, this must be a test. I, I know what you're doing here. You're testing me to see if I will sin. I'm not going to do it because I've kept kosher all my life. We have no reason to suspect that's anything but true. In verse 15, again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also, so, also called Peter, was staying there. Well, a couple of interesting things we can note here. First of all, how many times did this vision come to Peter before he got the point? Three times. Peter who denied Christ, three times. Peter to whom Jesus asked the question, three times, do you love me? Uh, it seems that Peter operates in a mental process of a pattern of three. It took three different times of this vision being presented to him until Peter got the point. But the point is not just about food, it's about the gospel. Because the whole kosher system divides between clean and unclean, and the Jewish mentality was exactly the same. Dividing the world between Gentile, which is unclean, and Jewish, which is clean. A Jewish man that had had any contact with a Gentile would have to go through a process of cleansing before he could even go to the temple and participate in Jewish worship. And so that mentality is not only food, it's faith, it's everything. And now Peter, in this moment of, of his, well, shall we say it was a teachable moment. That's what the educators call it these days. In this teachable moment, here comes this dream, and the Lord instructs Peter that he is no longer to discriminate between clean and unclean animals because God says, if I've declared it to be clean, it's clean. But we know that the food was to point to something more important, and that was Peter's opportunity to share the gospel with Cornelius and his household. Cornelius, a God-fearing Gentile. And the point, of course, is that in the Old Testament, what we find is the record of God calling a people who were to be a holy people unto his name. They were to stand out as distinct from all the other nations of the world. They were to bear his glory in a unique way. And they were to be as a lighthouse to the nations. But there would be a clear distinction between Israel and everyone else. A clear distinction between the children of the covenant, the children of the promise, and everyone else. But the book of Acts is about that logic being reversed. That in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation is to be preached to all the nations and by the Lord's command. And in the church, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And as we went through the book of Acts verse by verse over the last few years, we saw how that logic became embedded in a very understanding of what it means to be the church. We are distinct from the world as a holy people, not because of our race or ethnicity, but because we belong to Jesus. And as the body of Christ, we do stand out from the world, but it's not an ethnic, it's not a racial distinction, it's a theological and spiritual distinction, nor is it exclusivistic in that we are who we are and this is all we shall be. We are called to be the vessel of the gospel so that others will also hear and enter the kingdom of God by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ.
And so we have this distinction as Israel's identity is fulfilled in a very real way in the church and comprehensively we come to understand that there's a distinction between the exclusivism of Israel and the inclusivism of understanding that all peoples may come to Christ because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the gospel is to be preached to all. And so the kosher system is no more. We do not keep kosher in our households because we are not seeking to please God and to follow His command by having a a household that stands out from the world because of what we eat and because it, it establishes our identity as a nation. No, we should stand out from the world because the church is marked by holiness. And, and that's a very, very clear distinction. Israel's holiness was demonstrated by its eating habits, by its refusal to worship in pagan places, and by an entire system of law. Our holiness is to be demonstrated in other ways, but most importantly by our, our subservience to Christ, our discipleship under the sovereignty of Christ and under the authority of God's Word. The responsibilities given to the church are not less than those given to Israel, but far more. The urgency for us, the importance for us, is greater than for Israel. Because keeping all the minutia of the law was easy compared to fulfilling the Lord's commands in the New Testament. As to how we are to live, for instance, as demonstrated by the Sermon on the Mount. And that's a good place for us to to, to kind of transition our thinking. Because when we come to Deuteronomy chapter 15... We've come to the socioeconomics of the kingdom as demonstrated in Israel, and we're going to cover some new territory here. In chapter 15, verse 1, the Lord speaks through Moses to say to the people, At the end of every seven years you shall grant a remission of debts. This is the manner of the remission. Every creditor shall release what he has loaned to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother, because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. From a foreigner you may exact it, but your hand shall release whatever of yours is with your brother. However, there will be no poor among you, since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. If only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all this commandment which I am commanding you today. Let's continue reading through the text and then we'll go back. In verse 6, For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised you, and you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow, and you will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks." Beware that there is no base thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of remission is near, and your eye is hostile towards your poor brother, and you give him nothing. Then he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be sin in you. You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. All right. No poor. No poverty. This text says yes and no. Ideally, there should be no poverty in Israel. Ideally, there should be no want. There should be no lack. Because as the Lord blesses his people in this land of tremendous abundance, all should have not only sufficient, but more than is needed. And then at the same time, in verse 11, the Lord says through Moses, you're always going to have poor people. Jesus, you may remember, said to his own disciples, the poor you will always have with you. And let's admit this is one of those difficult issues. What should we as Christians think about economics and especially about poverty and about people in need? I can't think of anything more appropriate this morning as I was getting ready this morning, turned on the news as I was... Uh, pre- preparing to, to come, and uh, one of the big debates going on is uh, an, an overture from the administration to Congress about redefining Section 8 housing and poverty and all of this. And one of the things that's clear is that in our political system, you have two parties that have two very 
fundamentally different ideas about how poverty comes to be and how it should be addressed. Well, we as Christians know that poverty cries out for an answer. We also know that we serve a Lord who said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And a Lord who said, he who does this act of kindness in my name to the least of these demonstrates the kingdom. We know that in the early church there was a sharing of all things so that there was no one who was poor and no one who was in want. And we know the church is called to this kind of a benevolent ministry. But how should we think about these things? I want us to notice several principles. First of all, the economic system is rooted in an understanding of God's sovereignty. What do you own? Well, you could have a legal answer for that. We could add it all up and, and we could know what we own. We and uh, perhaps the bank own this plot of land and the house on it. And we own those things that are in it. Maybe we own a, a, a 401k or a stock portfolio. If so, we probably own less than we used to own. Uh, we, we may own all kinds of things. This is my coat. That's my car. How, how do I know? It's because the title has my name on it. These possessions are important to us, but ultimately, who owns these things? They belong to God. He's the maker of all things. The, the first principle of economics in the Scripture is that we really do not own anything. We are the stewards of those things that are within our possession. And, and the, they are within our possession, and that stewardship means that we have to be very careful about our exercise, use, protection of, stewardship of, of course, those things that we are allowed to have by God. But first and foremost, remember that the principle of the harvest in Israel was that the Lord owns the whole harvest. And so the idea of the tithe is not that God's going to come and take 10% of yours. It's that God's going to allow you to keep 90% of His. That's a completely different worldview. And so if we begin with understanding that we really do not own anything. And that's a liberating idea. Because we understand that we are not the sum total of our possessions. That's just not who we are. I was in Dallas years ago during the, the booming years of the economy. And in a shopping mall in North Dallas where I, I was driving through the parking lot, I saw for the first time a car that had the bumper sticker that said, He who dies with the most toys wins. And, you know, there are people that live that way. Their motto is get all you can, can all you get, sit on the lid and poison the rest. And that mentality, they're, they're, they're just there to, just to, to get as many things as they possibly can have. And he who dies with the most toys wins. I was at a Campus Crusade for Christ event not too long after that when I saw this kid wearing a T-shirt that said on the front, he who dies with the most toys is dot, dot, dot. And on the back it said, dead. You know, we're not taking it with us. If, if we are our possessions, then when we die, we're nothing. Well, that's a sad way to live, but remembering, first of all, that everything belongs to God, that's important. Secondly, we understand that we are to care for each other. There is a responsibility for us to care for each other. In the Bible, we are told, in the book of James, as well as in the book of Acts, as well as in Paul's writings interspersed throughout and in the commands of Jesus, we are told that if Christians allow fellow Christians to be in want then we actually violate our witness to the gospel. Because the world should be able to look to the church and see, say, see how they love each other, how they take care of each other. And, and generally Christians know this. That is not to say we are always faithful to this, but we know this. We know we are to take care of each other. You see that certainly written throughout this text. The principle here is that no one is to be in need. Where there is poverty, there is a problem. That's a clear barometer. Where there is poverty, there is a problem. So let's make that our third principle. If the first principle is that the, the Lord owns all things, and the second is that we are to care for each other, then the third is that poverty is not just about poverty. It never is. It ne it's never just about money. Because money is just money. It has to be about something else. And that something else is very, very important. Poverty is always a sign of sin. 
always. Poverty is always, in every case, in every place, under every circumstance, an evidence of sin. Because in a sinless world, there would be no poverty. Now, here you have two very different understandings of why poverty is sinful. And to understand that, we have to get to our fourth principle. And the fourth principle is also revealed in Scripture, and that is this. He who works, eats. In other words, work is so dignified in Scripture that work is clearly the antidote to poverty. So understand that it's the fourth principle. Work and poverty are to be absolutely in opposition. They're to be the contrast. He who does not work will be in poverty. He who works ought not to be in poverty. But if he will not work, he will not eat. That's not only to be found in the Old Testament, but also in the New. Where, for instance, Paul says to Timothy that if a man will not work and take care of his own household, he's worse than an unbeliever. So let's get to the basic question, why poverty? We've already said that poverty, wherever it exists, is the result of sin. It's a sign of sin. But what kind of sin? Well, here's where you have, in modern economic theory and in modern political debates, you have a clear distinction. Now, without using partisan labels, let's just label it liberal and conservative. The liberal view is that poverty is everywhere and at all times a demonstration of oppression. That the way poverty happens is that there are people who gain more control over assets than they should have, and they wring everything out of the little people so that the little people have nothing and they have no way to get anything, and they live by this plutocracy whereby they pull all wealth to themselves and they starve out the little people. And so poverty is because, as, for instance, Karl Marx said, you have the capitalists who will squeeze out the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the middle class, sides with the capitalists because that's the way they get to keep their power, and the proletariat just gets squeezed out. And the little people, they just, like a sponge, get squeezed out of water until there's nothing there. They have no recourse to capital. They have no way to make investments. They have no way to get power. And so workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains, the first words out of the Communist Manifesto. All right, now on the other side. The conservative says, well, I'll tell you why there's poverty. They're not working. Well, go get a job. You don't have food? Go work. The sinfulness, according to the, the conservative, is laziness, a lack of ambition. And, and most conservatives are in a position of saying, look, if you want to eat, this is a free country. If you want to be a millionaire, go for it. But don't come to me asking me to give of my hard-earned income so that you don't have to work. Now, who's right? Well, in some sense, both are. But in a very real sense, we're going to see the Bible sides with the dignity of work. Now, let me go over to the liberal argument for a moment. Not being a liberal, I want to be real honest with his argument. We do have to admit that there is, in human sinfulness, a desire for those that have to have more. And we do know that sinful people, being sinful, will try to get as much as they can possibly get. And you don't have to look very far to see plutocrats who, who will be robber barons and will try to squeeze everyone out. And so in comes the government to try to say, well, we need to regulate this. And so Teddy Roosevelt came along in the early 20th century, and what did he do? It was called trust-busting. And what was the great word of evil, sinful practice in that day? Monopoly. And you know what? Looking back at it, most of us would have to say, even conservatives, economic conservatives, we have to say, well, not really glad the government took that power on, but on the other hand, it was a good thing over time. 
because if there really was only one steel company in America, that's not really a free market. So the question is how to keep the market free and how to give all people access. And so the liberal does have some argument. You have to understand that, that sinfulness being as it is, there are certain people who if they had enough economic power, they would just squeeze it out of everyone else. But where the liberal argument falls is in pointing to that as the basic problem. The basic problem is, and I'm going to say over here, Mr. Conservative is right, people do not take responsibility for themselves. They do not work as they should work. Do you know what the greatest antidote to poverty in America is? Graduating from high school and getting married and staying married. If you graduate from high school in America and you get married and you stay married, your chances of being in poverty are extremely, extremely low. Poverty in America is primarily a problem of the breakdown of the family, of births outside of marriage. Poverty in America is primarily a problem of no intact family unit where there is someone in that family taking responsibility to earn a sufficient amount of income to take care of the family's needs. So we have created an incredible underclass in America that would never have been allowed to exist in Israel. So I make no apologies, and I, I will tell you that I, I believe that the liberal is out to lunch on economic theory. Because he believes that if he just gave everybody an equal amount, then everything would be solved. But it wouldn't be. Because there's some people who would be good stewards of that, and there would be other people who would be very poor stewards of that. There would be some people who would take theirs and make much more, and there would be some who would take theirs and gamble it away, or throw it away, or, or you know what exactly what I'm talking about. Make poor decisions. And so the, 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 the approach of the, of the liberal is, listen, people are going to make bad decisions, but they should still have what they need, and so we're going to give them what they need. The conservative position is, listen, we need to give people enough to get them on their feet, but once they're on their feet, it's their responsibility. And you see this in the new welfare reform b debate. You see the big society as it tried to take on the responsibility of the nanny state and how that is fun. No, you look at Western Europe, which tried to put together social wel welfare on a universal plan. No society can afford that. You realize that? No society. Western Europe is in a, in a horrible economic situation because of the, their social democratic theories. There's absolutely no way any society can pay for this because you can't buy your way out of poverty. You can only work your way out of poverty. And so in America, we're trying some interesting experiments, but you listen to the debates in Washington, it's, it's right out of Deuteronomy chapter 15. But let's look to the text. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a remission of debts. So every seven years in Israel, there was a Sabbath of debt. So an individual in Israel could take on debt, but for no more than seven years. Because on the seventh year, everything was forgiven. Now, how, how do you like that? Just, just imagine that uh, you buy a car, and uh, you get a, a book of six years' worth of payments. And if there's anything left over in the seventh year, it's just forgiven. Well, that's not the way it works. This kind of debt is different than what we think of today as consumer debt. Most Americans are in debt because they want to buy things they can't afford. And, and that's what it comes down to. And uh, that's not the kind of debt that is contemplated here. As a matter of fact, when I was in Atlanta as the editor of the Christian Index, I was taking part in a big demographic study, and all these suburbs in Atlanta were growing so fast, and you had Cobb County and North Fulton and, and Gwinnett County, and, and you had all these young couples with young children, and they were building all these single-family homes, and the average young family in Atlanta, it's worse now than it was then, but back then, the average family in Atlanta was living on 121% of its annual income. Now, you know, you can do that for a while. You just can't do that indefinitely. At some point, that, at some point, that consumer credit begins to roll up to such a point that, uh, well, as R.G. Lee used to preach in a very different context, payday someday, it's going to happen. You can only reorganize your debt so many times, and every time you do it, it gets bigger 
Back in the biblical time, as we're contemplating Israel's instructions here, debt came because an individual, in this case it would be a man or a household, would get in a net negative economic situation. Now, you ever been there? You ever been in a net negative economic situation? What that means is your bills are more than your income. Now, if you are in a net negative economic situation, in our society, well, there are certain things you can try to negotiate. But back then, the person you owed had every right to come and take from your possessions that which was equal to the debt or take you. Now, that's interesting. In other words, if I, if I owed someone some money and I could not pay him, then he had every right to come and take me to work off that debt. And so the debt was monetary and it was based in labor, as we shall see. But in the seventh year, there was to be a forgiveness of debt. And in verse 2, it says, This is the man of remission. Every creditor shall release that which he has loaned to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother, because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. Now, why would there be this system of every seven years canceling the debts? It was specifically, we might call it the Lord's trust busting plan to prevent some individuals from using the power of their economic ingenuity or economic leverage to wipe every other family off uh, of the area. They could basically take all their farms and, and all the rest by putting them in a net negative economic situation. So in Israel, the net negative was canceled after six years. And so after the, the sixth year, your creditor had to say, you're paid up in full. And not only that, there had to be a restoration. Look at verse 3. From a foreigner you may exact it, but from your hand, your hand shall release whatever is yours of your neighbor. In verse 4, however, there will be no poor among you, since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. Verse 4 says that because of the fertility, the fecundity, the powerful blessings of the promised land, no one should be poor. Now, that's the Lord saying, I am not sending you into the promised land in order that you would have a poverty problem. This is the land flowing with milk and honey. You're, there's plenty for everyone. So there should be no poor among you. But as the Lord knows, and as he later says, there will be. If only you listen obediently to the Lord to observe carefully all his commandments, which I'm commanding you today. So put four and five together. What is the Lord's plan? What is the Lord's anti-poverty plan? Obey my law. Fulfill my commandments. Obey my voice. Then there'll be no poor. So poverty, again, is a sign of sinfulness. Verse 6, for the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised you. And, and he says here, you will lend to many nations. So in other words, Israel's wealth has to be demonstrated in that Israel as a nation is never in a net negative economic situation, but the other nations come to Israel to borrow money. And Israel is never to borrow money from another nation. Now look at verse 7. If there's a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need and whatever he lacks. So if there is someone in need, give him what he lacks. Beware there's no base thought on you, verse 9. In other words, this is not to be done begrudgingly. This is not to be done also in a way as you see in, uh, in verses 9 to 11. You're, the, the one who is the lindor is never to calculate as the fifth and sixth year come, you know, how can I kind of divest myself so that when the seventh year comes, I don't have to give this guy anything. No, the Lord says to his people, you be honest about this. Such that on that seventh year, you really are resetting the books in a way that you're resetting this man economically. It didn't mean that there was a pure division as you have some modern political theorists who say that the only way to be fair is to give everyone an equal portion. No, it doesn't say that the rich man gives the poor man an equal portion. It, it is that he gives him enough that he's reset again and he should be able to make it on his own. But there's more here. Look at verse 12. If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years, but in the seventh year you shall set him free. And when you have set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat. You shall give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this day. 
It shall come about if he says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household since he fares well with you. Then you shall take an awl and pierce it through his ear into the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Also you shall do likewise to your maidservant. It shall not seem hard to you when you set him free, for he has given you six years with double the service of a hired man. So the Lord your God will bless you in whatever you do. (laughs) Well, what's the Bible's position on slavery? It's a controversial issue. You hear liberal biblical scholars say, listen, why do we care what the Bible says about homosexuality or abortion or anything else? The Bible's an outmoded book. It's filled with outmoded practices. And we've, we've morally grown out of the New Testament and out of the Bible in terms of its morality. Because after all, the Bible sanctions slavery, does it? It does. If you end the tape here, I'm in big trouble. Yeah, the Bible does sanction slavery. Not the kind of slavery is practiced in the world in most places today and certainly in the American uh, tragic history of chattel slavery. Slavery in the New Testament, as regulated by Scripture, is a social safety net. And long term, it can only be entered willingly. Do you see that? You see, someone may be in debt such that he becomes a slave to another for six years, but in the seventh year, he has to be set free. And not only is he set free, and notice it's not only a he, but it's a she. Very important here. We almost unexpectedly find the maidservant here because of, of the, the focus upon the men as the, house, uh, the head of the household. But here you have the manservant or the maidservant. At the end of six years, they're set free. Not only are they set free, they are set free with goods so that they're economically reset again so that they can prosper. So slavery as sanctioned in the Scripture is actually a form of, of, of what we might call long-term employment. Look at the text here very carefully. In verse 12, we're told here that someone is sold, and that, that again is an economic burden. That means that they're in debt. Then he shall serve you six years, but in the seventh year you shall set him free. So you can have someone under your servitude because of a debt for six years. But in the seventh year, you set him free. And verse 13 says, you set him free, economically replenished. In other words, he is also, he's actually earned from you not only the repayment of his debt, but enough that you should get him you know, restarted again economically. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock and threshing floor and wine vat. So this is a picture of a man who has been in indentured servitude. He's been a, a slave for six years. But when he leaves, the man to whom he owed the debt says, look, you've paid it in full. It, by the Lord's command, it's paid in full. Not only that, but you're going to have some, some animals and some grain and some wine so that you're not immediately in poverty. So what you need to go out and to do is have a new start and... Uh, and begin all over again in the land of promise. Verse 15, there's a moral here. The people of Israel are to remember, that is the lender, the the one who is the the master here, you are to remember that you were once a slave in the land of Egypt, so that experience of slavery should be a very, very bitter memory. And, and of course, under Pharaoh, there was no manumission after six years. There was no remission. There, There was no... Liberty after the sixth year? No, that was a slavery that only the Lord could redeem his people from. And here you have it, it, it said in verse 16. On the other hand, there may be some who do not want to leave. If, if he says to you, if the slave says, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household since he fares well with you. So in other words, it is in this man's own analysis that he is better off in the household of this wealthy man then he would be on his own. Then he says to the man, I don't want to leave your house. I, I like working for you. This is, this is good for me. Now, to put together all the, the Old Testament regulations here, if you had a man or a woman who was your servant in this way, you were responsible for their health, their well-being, their protection. You had to feed them. You had to clothe them. Remember in the parable of the prodigal son, when the, the young man who's, who's run away and he comes to his senses in Luke 15, he remembers his father's house and what does he say? He said, I will be better off being a slave on my father's home than being here. Because in Israel, unlike in the foreign territory where he had taken himself, in Israel, the slave had to be taken care of as if he were a member of the family. 
And so he says, I'm going back. If, if, the, if my father will have me back, I'd rather be a slave there after he'd abandoned his sonship. Well, you see why when you look at a text like Deuteronomy chapter 15. But if this slave or this servant does say, I want to stay, I, I, I love you. Now, notice that's in the text. This is respect and, and love and, uh, and, and, and at home. This, this, this person feels at home here and says, I want to stay here. I want to be in your employ. And then, then there came a ceremony, and it was an all where the sharp object was put through the lobe of the ear into the door frame. Now, you think, that is barbaric. That, I mean, that's awful. What an awful picture. I mean, here you have this all and a hammer and an ear. Well, ladies and gentlemen, go to the shopping mall and see who pierces ears. Yes, Mary and I uh, grew up uh, with uh, a fellow in our home church uh, who went, and, and, and he's in the jewelry business. And uh, we went to school with him, and uh, he, was, he was a close friend. And uh, he was not exactly someone you would trust surgery to, okay? But he started working in a jewelry store, and he pierced ears. He had this little machine, and they put the ear in there and pierce it. My wife allowed that man to pierce her ears. I still think it's one of the bravest things she ever did. I cannot imagine that. Fast forward, Katie's about 10 years old, and she wants to have her ear pierced. A lot of girls are having their ears pierced. She wants to have her ear pierced. I said, sweetheart, it was younger, older. Well, when she asked, I think it was about then. The, the, the point, I think, I think she was about 10 when she started speaking about that. I said, that's fine. I, I, I'm glad you have pierced ears. I just do the piercing. Got an awl, got a potato. And we can get this done. You know, <laughs> the idea cooled for a while. It's not that barbaric. A ring was put in the ear as a sign of this voluntary joining of the family in this way as as a servant. And uh, you are to to take care of this person. And that, notice that this says, You shall likewise do your maidservant. It shall not seem hard to you when you set him free. For he's given you six years with double the service of a hired man, so the Lord your God will bless you in whatever you do. So if the man wants to stay, then you put the, you put the mark in his ear and you accept him as a permanent part of your household. And it puts the responsibility primarily now upon the man who must provide as well as the man who must work. And, and that's, that's, it really is a, a social safety net. How is there to be no poverty? It's because even those who have no land or have made bad decisions and have lost what they had, they can only be in indentured servitude for six years, and then they have to be freed, and they have to be freed with possessions, a reinvestment. But if they want to stay, then they can stay, but then they have to be treated as a member of the household. But if, if they leave, notice the logic here. It's very important here. In verse 18, the logic is, when you set him free, you should not feel hard about this. For he's given you six years with double the service of a hired man. Now, this is one of those Hebrew expressions that's notoriously difficult to translate. But it ends up the same way either way you go. Either this text says he's worked for you at, for six years at half the cost, or it says he's worked for you for six years at double the service. Either way, it's the same thing. In other words, if you just went out to hire an employee, you'd have to pay him more than you pay this man who had been your slave, because after all, he was living in your house and, 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 and caring for you and doing all these things. So when you set him free, there should be no hardness in your heart. You've got more than you paid for. So you invest him with those goods so that he can reset his life and his family and his economic situation. What we find in verses 19 through 23 is a repetition of what came from chapter 14. So that was just to give out the dietary tithe and about some of the dietary principles. The economic section really ends with verse 18. So how do we sum all this up? Well, remember our principles. God owns everything. We are to care for each other. Poverty is always a, a, a sign of sin, and the Bible dignifies labor. So how do we put all that together? Well, it means that we understand a very simple equation that didn't just come out of economic development or human cultural and social evolution, and that is work plus time equals prosperity. It's a simple equation. 
work plus time equals prosperity. Get rich quick schemes fail. Because in the biblical worldview, there's only one way really to gain wealth, and that is to work hard and to be wise. You put in the book of Proverbs, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the ant. Wisdom is the ant that's always working. And if you've ever watched the ants, you know they will make us look like absolute sluggards. They're always working. You've got this tiny little ant. He's got this huge crumb held, held over his head. And he, when he dumps it off, what does he do? He goes and gets more. When do ants sleep? They don't sleep much. They're going the whole time. And the, in the book of Proverbs, we're told, you know, be like the ant. Work is dignified to such an extent that those who will not work are condemned as, as failing to follow the Lordship of Christ, giving a bad example to the world. And as Paul said to Timothy, they're worse than an unbeliever. A man who won't care for his own family is worse than an unbeliever because even they know they bear this responsibility. So how do we get people out of poverty? Well, we have an entire system of social welfare in this country, and the government, you're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars being spent, and we haven't made much progress. Because poverty is not primarily a social problem, it's a moral problem. It's a moral problem as demonstrated in the demographics. We should not expect that a woman having children out of wedlock is going to be rich. As a matter of fact, she is not only a dependent, there you have two dependents with no one meeting their dependency. Marriage is the cornerstone of society because God gave us the union of a man and a woman and the establishment of a home with the children he shall give them in such a way that there would be the strength of his, of his very divine, gracious intention for us. When we tamper with that, we make a mess. What's, the, what's a second leading cause of, of poverty in America today? Divorce. Same principle. When you tamper with marriage, you have a problem. What happens in your typical divorce? The man is economically empowered and the woman is economically unempowered. Uh, usually in a divorce, the, uh, the mother and children, if there are minor children, suffer a severe uh, economic downturn, status, loss of economic status. The man, well, he's freed from a lot of responsibility. And, you know, you can come up with any child payment or, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of payment, alimony or whatever. It's never going to make up for it. So we need to understand that where there is poverty, there is a deeper problem. And we have to get at that deeper problem. What about in the church? How are we to, to be faithful to these commands? Well, we, let's go back to the second principle. We are to care for each other. There will be times when Christians who are hard at work and are seeking to be good stewards of all they have, will be an economic need. That's going to happen. And that's why a church like this church, that's why a class like this class needs to have a safety net so that we care for each other. Such that, that we would not be able to live with our consciences if someone in this church or someone in this class, someone, a, a brother or sister of our knowledge, was without. I mean, woe unto us, condemnation upon us, if we knew that anyone in, in our a reach was going without food or clothing or medical care. It would be our responsibility. It is our responsibility to help care for them. Now, one of the ways we need to do that is as a church. That is, rather than just individual to individual, that's why it's important that a church have a system for having a way of evaluating need and meeting those needs. And Highview does have such a system. And, you know, we, we are not often perhaps thinking about it until there's a moment of emergency, but we need to, to remember that. And uh, that's, that's important because the second principle comes in, and that is that when we do help those in need, we're helping to get them back on their feet, not to keep them off their feet. It does no one any good. It is an act not of love, but of disrespect to say to a person, we'll just take care of you, you don't worry about it. No, the biblical worldview is that we help persons to get back on their feet economically, so to speak. We help them to get reset. We help them to learn how to take care of themselves. And that means that you can never take responsibility totally for another. 
Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 15. There's only one way in which you assume that kind of responsibility, and that's if someone becomes a part of your household in the way that this, this servant would as demonstrated in verse 16. There are so many difficult questions. Difficult questions debated in the Congress. Difficult questions debated in the tax law. You know, the interesting this week the, uh, the, 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 with the tax uh, bill that came down, passed by the House and the Senate, and now coming to the president. You, you heard all the flurry this week about the fact that uh, something like 11 million children were going to be denied the tax credit. You see that? It was all over the news. They were beating up on it. Well, what does that mean? Well, those who weren't going to get it were those that didn't pay any taxes or insufficient taxes to get it back. So actually what you had was liberal Democrats in Washington saying, listen, we ought to give people, even if they didn't pay any taxes, we ought to refund their taxes in an equal way. Well, what kind of sane economy refunds people that didn't pay? And then they say, well, you're, see, you're against the poor, you're, you're for the rich. Well, without getting into the politics of the situation, you see the, the debate being played out at the national level, and we all live it at the micro level. Anyone who travels anywhere, if you go out of your house, you're likely to find this. Especially if you go to the major cities of America, there are street people all over the place. And, and they, they'll, they'll be begging for money. And how does the Christian conscience respond to that? Well, I would suggest that unless you can do something constructive for the person, do not give them money. That's not a biblical safety net. Christopher and I, I think I may have told you this at one point. I'll just repeat it again because it was one of those glaring illustrations. Christopher and I were down on Bardstown Road, and this happened. A woman came up, and she asked for money. I wasn't about to give her money, and she said she was hungry. And there was a sandwich shop there. I said, well, I'll buy you a sandwich. And she said, well, okay. And I did it. I bought her a sandwich. And she was hungry. I, 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 I could not live with someone being hungry if I could meet that need. And there she was, and there was a sandwich shop, but she really wanted that. But just a few feet down, there was another man that said, uh, I, I, same pattern. You know, can you give me some money? And I said, what do you need? He said, I'm hungry. And I said, well, there's a sandwich shop. I'll buy you a sandwich. And he cussed me out. He didn't want a sandwich. He wanted something very, very different. In liquid form is my guess, or worse. And you know what? That's the difference. In other words, <laughs> giving... Either of those two people money really wouldn't have solved anything. And I really can't help the man that cussed me out. But that, that's the kind of picture that's contemplated here in Scripture. You can't really help that person. Not, not by giving him money. It's, it's going to take a whole lot more to help that person. And we as a society are not facing that reality. We're not facing it very well. Two things we need to think about here out of Deuteronomy 15 as we come to a conclusion. First, the responsibility of the church to its own. That's very, very important for us. And, and that, that's where we need to learn how to live it out in a way that fulfills the Lord's glory by showing the love Christians have for each other by the fact we care for each other, even as we expect each other to work. The second thing is at the political level. And here Christians on a given bill, on a given economic plan on a given political or economic question may differ about exactly what, which is best. And, and th that's why we as Christians have to understand there, there's not just a Christian economic plan we can take to Congress and say, do this. But there are some critical principles that we ought always to have in mind. And the dignity of work is very important. Individual responsibility is very important, as well as understanding that, yes, there are those who will oppress the poor, and the Scripture has so many, many passages that talk about the judgment upon those who will oppress the poor in order to keep them poor. That's where we end. What is the Christian understanding of our responsibility in poverty? It is to help people get out. Unlike the liberal who says that we just, we, we just are going to have to deal with this and, and, and keep them uh, fed and, and clothed uh, even because they can't help themselves, we say, no, they can't help themselves. We need to help them help themselves. But unlike some on the other side who would say, look, 
it, it doesn't really matter if the rich get richer and richer and richer at the expense of everyone else. We do understand there are some limitations to that. There are very, very interesting days with interesting questions in which we live. Just in closing, I, I remember a, a story that was told by Ronald Reagan. He said that in America, whenever a stretch limousine goes by, he said uh, the man on the street looks up and sees that car and says, you know, everyone ought to ride in a car like that. I ought to ride in a car like that. I'd like to ride in a car like that. He said in the Soviet Union, every time a big stretch limousine came by, the fellow on the street would look at it and say, nobody ought to ride in a car like that. He said, I'd rather be a part of a society that believes that everybody ought to ride in a car like that than the one that believes that no one ought to ride in a car like that. Well, the point is, we are thankful to be in a society which allows us opportunity in a fallen world to have the dignity of our labor rewarded with income and investment rewarded with income, even as it assumes risk. But we do understand that every single economic system is fallen. And this side of the kingdom of God, every single economic system is flawed. Our Father, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would apply this scripture to our hearts such that we would be...